Health misinformation is a problem. The current pandemic illustrates the challenges of science communication and the dangers of unreliable or false health information. So, how do we communicate about reliable health information in a fluctuating information landscape where new research is constantly emerging, often with an absence of scientific consensus, or to the general public who often lack basic scientific understanding or knowledge? Health misinformation is far from new, as early knowledge about human disease focused on superstition, myths, and religion. The invention of the printing press in 1450 allowed for invented facts to circulate widely in Europe. Similar to modern Facebook posts, cheap weekly publications of broadsides, like the Lord Have Mercy, appeared during the 17th century Black Death Plague outbreaks. In an effort to be helpful, they would publish home remedies to help protect from the disease. There were other strangely bizarre cures for the Black Death. A treatment named the Vicari Method involved plucking feathers from a chicken's rump and then tying the chicken to the patient so that the chicken's now bare backside was touching the person's swollen lymph nodes. The notion behind this interesting cure was that people believed that chickens breathe through their bottoms, so therefore the chicken would draw out the infection from the person. Anti-vaccination has been around for nearly as long as vaccination itself. Widespread smallpox vaccination began in the early 1800s, following Edward Jenner's cowpox experiments. Jenner's experiments were met with immediate public criticism and skepticism. Objections included belief that the vaccine was unchristian because it came from an animal, a general distrust in medicine, allegations that smallpox resulted from decaying matter in the atmosphere, and lastly, many people objected to vaccination because they believed it violated their personal liberty. The first documented anti-vaccine group, the National Anti-Vaccination League, appeared in 1866 after Britain's government tried to mandate smallpox vaccinations for its constituents. All sorts of messaging emerged from that group, including religious stances arguing that getting sick was part of God's plan, and libertarian views, points of view that proclaim the government can't tell individuals what to do. Before studies showed that cigarette smoking caused cancer, tobacco companies recruited the medical community for their ads. Many doctors smoke themselves, so tobacco companies used a doctor's authority to make claims about their cigarettes seem more legitimate. Cigarette companies would place ads claiming doctors had conducted studies showing when smokers changed to Company X cigarettes, every case of throat irritation cleared completely, or that their cigarettes were less irritating to sensitive and tender throats than other cigarettes. By the mid-1950s, when tobacco companies had to confront good evidence that their products caused lung cancer, advertising strategies shifted and the cigarette ads stopped featuring doctors because it was no longer a convincing tactic. The cigarette example shows how effective adopting science-like arguments are in public health debates. Fluoride is a mineral that occurs naturally in most water supplies, and although fluoridation is a safe and effective way to prevent tooth decay, an anti-fluoridation movement organized against it, arguing that fluoride was poison, a claim that residents of many communities found so persuasive that they voted to reject fluoridation. Does this sound familiar? The poison argument morphed into a conspiracy theory among some conservatives that fluoride was actually a mind control agent introduced into water as part of a communist plot to overtake the United States. Anti-fluoridationists also use the big lie technique. They claim that fluoridation causes cancer, heart and kidney disease, and other serious ailments that people fear. Or they say that fluoridation doesn't work. The fact that there's no supporting evidence for such claims does not matter. The big lie trick is to keep repeating them because if something is said often enough, people tend to think there must be some truth to it. Many municipalities have resisted fluoridation due to misinformation. And it was recently reported that an official in a small town in Vermont has been quietly reducing the amount of fluoridation in the water supply for years due to misinformation. Researchers have defined an information disorder framework 
that identifies and characterizes three forms of harmful information. Misinformation is information that is false, inaccurate, or misleading according to the best available evidence at the time. It's false information that people spread through communities, within families, and between friends, regardless of whether or not there's an intent to mislead. Many people who share misinformation aren't trying to misinform. Instead, they may be raising a concern, making sense of conflicting information, seeking answers to honest questions, or because they find it interesting and relevant to what's going on in the world. Research shows that Facebook users engage with misinformation, which often takes the form of fake news, 70 million times per month on average. On Twitter, people share false content 4 million to 6 million times per month. Disinformation is misinformation that is spread with the full knowledge of its inaccuracy to serve a malicious purpose, such as to trick people into believing something for financial gain or political advantage. People who create or spread disinformation are usually motivated by three distinct goals, to make money, to have political influence, and to cause trouble for the sake of causing trouble. Malinformation is genuine, genuine or factual information that is shared with an intent to cause harm. This is the weaponization of context that uses genuine content, but content that is warped and reframed, since anything with a kernel of truth is far more successful in terms of persuading and engaging people. And within the health information realm, a fourth framework has recently been added. Mid-information, which is a sort of information crisis that happens when not all the facts are known, or the information is constantly changing due to scientific updates or breakthroughs. So the biggest difference between misinformation and disinformation is intent to harm. Here is a spectrum of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, ranging from low to high harm, with satire at the one end, onto clickbait content, misleading content, genuine content reframed with a false context, imposter content with a, when an organization's blog or influential name is linked to false information to manipulated and finally fabricated content. Going forward, I will just use the term misinformation to keep things simple. The health harm for misinformation lies in the power of false or misleading information to shape health behaviors and undermine individual and public health. False or misleading information about diseases, illnesses, potential treatments and cures, vaccines, diets, and cosmetic procedures is especially harmful and is causing people to make decisions that could have dangerous consequences for their health. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, misinformation has caused people to decline COVID-19 vaccines, reject public health measures such as masking and physical distancing, and use unproven treatments, resulting in hospitalizations and even death. According to our Reuters Institute analysis conducted in 2020 on a sample of false content on COVID-19, as much as 59% was based to a degree on true information that has been manipulated, whereas 38% was entirely fabricated. In the case of emerging knowledge, it is helpful to think not just about misinformation, but mid-information. Challenges are frequently present in science communication, where the difficulties lie in how to communicate effectively in a shifting information landscape. Updating guidance and recommendations based on new evidence is an essential part of the scientific process. How do you effectively communicate when new health research is constantly emerging or where there is lack of scientific consensus? It can be difficult for people to know how to figure out what to believe, which sources to trust, and how to keep up with changing knowledge and guidance. If misinformation is based on having some sort of truth out there that is being proven or disproven, a fact being fact-checked, what does it mean to fact-check information that is shifting, emerging, or contested? Mid-information might be defined as informational ambiguity, based on scant or conflicting evidence often about emerging scientific knowledge. Health mid-information falls into many categories, which include contextual, where a fact is only true in certain contexts, information that is rooted in tradition or is out of date, that there is insufficient evidence or the disease or condition is not currently being researched, or 
that any factual information is not actually knowable. It takes time for scientific consensus to build and a longer time for the public understanding of that consensus to catch up. It goes without saying that people are complex. Those who create or spread misinformation are driven by many socio-psychological factors. We not, may not be able to fully understand why someone shares or creates harmful health information. Their intentions may be mixed, unclear, or even change over time. Human psychology and sociocultural factors leave people highly vulnerable to accepting and spreading false health information. In addition, technological advances such as the internet, social media, and smartphones have fostered an age where misinformation can be widely accessed and shared. Psychological research looks at individual differences in demographics, personality, and other traits of those who are more likely to believe misinformation and conspiracy theories with the ultimate goal of characterizing the underlying processes that lead people to accept such claims. Psychological factors that can make people vulnerable to sharing or creating misinformation include, but are not limited to, emotion. When evaluating the accuracy of information, reliance on emotion, as opposed to reasoning, is predictive of belief in misinformation. Specific emotions, such as anger, anxiety, or fear, may increase susceptibility to misinformation and may also influence spreading behaviors. Social credibility or self-identity. People are more likely to perceive a piece of information as credible if other people also perceive it as credible, or they are more likely to perceive information as credible when it comes from their in-group, the people they identify with. People prefer spending time in echo chambers or filter bubbles, places where they can find others who hold worldviews similar to their own. Such communities require less cognitive work and provide safe spaces for expressions of identity and viewpoint. Some traits that make people vulnerable to misinformation include age. There are some studies that suggest that being older is generally associated with higher susceptibility to misinformation. Adults over the age of 65 were seven times more likely to share misinformation on Facebook than those between 18 and 29. One reason older adults, especially those over the age of 80, share false information on social media more frequently may be that they have reduced ability to detect fake news as they are more likely to engage in shallow information processing, including not looking as closely at information or paying attention to details. Older adults may also experience digital illiteracy with their fewer years of experience with clickbait and internet hoaxes that could explain why they appear gullible to online misinformation. Educational attainment. People who have achieved higher educational levels are less likely to believe misinformation and conspiracies in contrast to people with lower educational or reading levels who are more likely to believe misinformation and conspiracy theories. Health, technology, and media literacy. Low health literacy can make people more susceptible to believing and spreading health misinformation they find online. They are less likely to trust health information from specialist doctors and dentists, but are more likely to trust television, social media, blogs, celebrity web pages, friends, and family. Political ideology plays a large and significant part in the majority of false information consumption, which occurs mainly amongst those who identify along the conservative right wing. Racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic identities who are rooted in a rational distrust for healthcare and other socio-political systems that have not proven themselves to be trustworthy and continue to perpetuate disproportionate harms against historically marginalized groups. And finally, religion. Those who hold stronger religious beliefs tend to be less deferential to scientists and less scientifically literate. Cognitive biases and disordered thinking can make people more susceptible to misinformation. Disordered thinking or cognitive disorders are negative biases in thinking that are thought to represent vulnerability factors. A cognitive distortion is an exaggerated pattern of thought or biased perspectives that's not based on facts. It consequently leads the person to view things more negatively than they really are. So cognitive distortions is the mind convincing you to believe negative things about yourself and your world that are not necessarily true. When negative thoughts are treated as facts, people may act in a way based on faulty assumptions. 
These patterns and systems of thought are often subtle and can become a regular feature of day-to-day -day thoughts. Beliefs that people unknowingly reinforce over time. Cognitive distortions become in many, many forms. One example is the fallacy of change. We expect other people will change their ways to suit your expectations or need, particularly when you pressure them enough. Cognitive bias refers to a systematic error in the thinking process. Such biases are essentially mental shortcuts, which allow people to make an inference about the credibility of a source of information without extensive deliberation or reflective judgment. Biases often work as rules of thumb that help people make sense of the world and reach decisions with relative speed. As with cognitive distortions, there are many cognitive biases. A very common example is confirmation bias, which occurs from the direct influence of desire on beliefs. When people would like a certain idea or concept to be true, they end up believing it to be true. They are motivated by wishful thinking. For historically marginalized groups, distrust in the healthcare system looms large in the sharing of health information. The Tuskegee study is an example of why this exists. In 1932, the Public Health Service, working with the Tuskegee Institute, began the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, or the Tuskegee experiment, as it is commonly known, a medical study on the long-term effects of untreated syphilis that involved 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, and 201 without the disease. The study designers neglected to tell the participants that they had syphilis and did not allow those patients who did have syphilis to receive proper treatment, only placebos, even after it was discovered after 1947 that penicillin was an effective treatment, all so that the researchers could see the natural progression of the disease in over a more than 25 year span, all without their consent. Many participants died from complications of syphilis and many wives, girlfriends, and children contracted the disease. The researchers never shared the purpose of the study with participants and did not follow any of the protocols of informed consent. The effect of this and other similar research projects eroded public trust in medicine, which persists even now, especially among Black Americans, which leads many of them to question public health campaigns. So, why is it so tempting to share health misinformation? We want to feel connected to others. It feels good to share. There are social rewards in sharing in the form of likes, comments, and shares. These forms of positive reinforcement are applied regardless of the truthfulness of content. There are often no repercussions when sharing false or misleading information. We like to feel that we have new information that others don't know. In effect, making the person passing it on appear well-informed and intelligent. We want to protect the people we care about. Sharers often have good intentions and sharing demonstrates not only what is valuable to them as individuals, but also what they believe is important interesting, entertaining, or useful to others. We may be seeking explanations or wanting to share information that helps us make sense of events or health issues or concerns, and unfortunately, sharers don't always think sufficiently about the accuracy of content when deciding what to share. There are essentially two categories of people who are disproportionately responsible for the sharing of false, misleading, and hyperpartisan information on social media. The creators, the enthusiast. I post misinformation frequently in support of a person or a cause. The mischief maker. I create false or misleading information to see if I can fool people for the fun of it. The disinformer. I deliberately create harmful disinformation. The hoaxer. I create hoaxes to fool people, sometimes to make money. And the shares, the overshare. When I see something online that seems helpful or worrying, I like to share without checking because I'd rather people have as much information as possible. The casual share. I tend to spend a lot of time online and it can sometimes share carelessly while waiting in line or scrolling late at night in bed. And the believer. I am deeply connected to an online community that is pushing false, misleading claims. I believe the information being shared by the community is true and I want to share with others. There is research that shows that people are more likely to fall for misinformation when they fail to carefully evaluate the credibility of the material. 
whether or not it's aligned with their views or beliefs. This suggests that passive viewers, sharers, rather than malicious creators, may be the bigger problem in misinformation sharing. Being aware of the types of misinformation sharing tactics and venues can help with evaluating and disarming misinformation spread. Misinformation can spread rapidly and on multiple platforms. Bots, trolls, social media and fake news sites, even word of mouth can spread misinformation. Research shows that misinformation often spreads faster than real news online. Regular users of social media are to blame for a lot of misinformation spread as they like, share, and otherwise engage with posts containing misinformation. Social media platforms do struggle with what to do about misinformation as they try to find and address the problem while existing within a democratic system that tolerates different beliefs and free speech. Misinformation is increasingly transmitted via messaging services such as WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger that are close to external observers and content moderators and are therefore less visible and easy to counteract at their origin. In the United States, more than 90% of adults get their news from online sources, either via mobile or desktop applications. Social media are key drivers of traffic to news sites with Facebook leading the way. Bots allow a small number of voices to mimic broad social consensus through automated processes that amplify information on social media platforms. Particular individuals rely on their status as online influencers to drive the spread of media in misinformation campaigns. The purpose of trolling is to provoke others into displaying emotional responses or to normalize tangential discussions, either for amusing or personal gain. Then there is micro-targeting, which is information that is targeted to the specific user based on past search history or sites visited. Some common types of misinformation tactics include websites that look professional. They are often designed to look like news or medical sites, but the stories are all false or misleading. They have sensational headlines or include a logo of an established organization, like the CDC, all designed to make people click on them. Quotation, where the beginning or end have been deleted to change the meaning. The person did say that, but while the, off the full context, it's not an accurate representation of what they said. This happens frequently with legitimate researchers having their actual research misrepresented. An example of this is when political agendas intrude into health information. It was recently reported that a document posted on the Florida Health Department site on care for transgender minors misquoted or took out of context several researcher study results to justify the state's anti-transgender stance. The researchers quoted had no idea that their work was being used or misquoted. Then there are the experts, who are not experts on the subject, that are commonly quoted. It is unfortunately possible to find someone with scientific credentials who is against just about anything. And they may use sometimes anti-documentation where information is quoted from out of date or hard to find journals. And then there is creating misleading anecdotal content. It's very difficult to fact check someone who says, this happened to me or someone I know. Old images or videos that recirculate as if they were actually very recent. An example here is an old video of a doctor spreading COVID misinformation that was revived that actually happened in 2020 and it was just recently reposted. Or the image from an earthquake in Croatia earlier this year that was posted as examples of what COVID looked like in Italy. Misleading graphs, images, or diagrams that look official but don't tell the whole story or give a false impression of legitimacy like someone wearing a white coat or holding a stethoscope. The pictured graph is a classic in that the creators inverted the numbers on the y-axis to give the impression that gun deaths had significantly dropped when they actually hadn't. Cherry picked statistics. Too often people choose the numbers that support what they want to argue, but without all the data, they haven't provided the context. Here's an example of one of a cherry picked report. Memes. 
Those fun, colorful images or graphics that were created as a joke, the people start resharing, thinking or believing or claiming they're true. The meme, the wildlife photography gone wrong was just a bunch of National Geographic photographers having fun. They photoshopped the bear in, but it was picked up and it's been repeated as something that has actually happened. Videos or images that have been edited to change the meaning are taken out of context. An example here is from December 2022, a fictional newscast clip featuring scenes from catastrophic contagion, part of a typical health, public health disaster preparedness exercise, were shared online, online alongside claims it was evidence of a disease outbreak being deliberately planned. A misinformation tactic that is nearly as old as human civilization is propaganda. Propaganda is defined as a communication whose purpose is to influence the attitudes of a community or a group of people for a cause or position. The basic purpose of propaganda is to persuade people by providing distorting information. Most of the time, propaganda is biased and its sole purpose is to inspire people to accept a particular viewpoint. Unfortunately, public health campaigns can inspire propaganda backlash. Within 48 hours of the first people in the U.S. receiving COVID-19 vaccine, anti-vaccine activists were amplifying stories of allergic reactions and sharing claims about friends of friends whom vaccines had supposedly injured or killed. Participants in anti-vaccine groups online frequently see posts claiming that the government is using COVID vaccines to secretly implant microchip identifiers in people, or that the ingredients in vaccines will turn people into 5G antennas or change their DNA. Some techniques of propaganda are name calling, glittering generality, transfer device, testimonial device, plain folk device, card tactics, and bandwagon. Another misinformation tactic is to use logical fallacies, which share many similarities to cognitive biases. Logical fallacies are common patterns of reasoning that seem true on the surface but have one or more critical flaws. They are super normal and everyone uses them. Many logical fallacies at the root are oversimplification, like cognitive shortcuts. They are appealing because they take something complex like vaccine safety or the efficacy of masks and convert it into something simple and easy to understand. This oversimplification, however, often leaves out important details leading to inaccurate conclusions. When someone uses a fallacy in their argument, it doesn't automatically mean they're wrong or stupid. It simply means that they haven't provided adequate evidence supporting their argument, evidence which may or may not exist. Fallacies may be created unintentionally, or they may be created intentionally in order to deceive other people. There are literally hundreds of logical fallacies. Identifying logical fallacies is a method that can be used to determine whether information found online is valid or factual. An example of a logical fallacy is a false dichotomy fallacy, which takes a complex topic and falsely asserts that there are only two possible explanations when in fact more explanations exist. An example of this is where it is suggested that the presence of breakthrough infections proves that COVID vaccines don't work. This is a false dichotomy, as it suggests that there are only two possible options for vaccine efficiency. One, the vaccine stopped 100% of the infections all of the time, or two, the vaccines are completely ineffective. In reality, neither of these options is correct. John Cook of SkepticalScience.com has been dealing for a long time with disinformation on climate change. He developed a framework of the five most common methods of science denial and called it the Techniques of Science Denial, or FLIC, which stands for Fake Experts, Logical Fallacies, Impossible Expectations, Cherry Picking, and Conspiracy Theories. Within these five categories, further subtypes can be found. Cook believes that once people are introduced to and have seen through the basic science denial strategies, they are much less susceptible to further attempts at disinformation, that they are then basically immunized against their spread. In a world of competing facts and alternative facts, it is increasingly important to adopt evidence-based communication strategies to ensure that people hear and adopt public health recommendations. We need to teach library users how information works, not just how to find and select information, 
but to also understand the social context that influence how information is created and disseminated. There are numerous studies that show people hold libraries and librarians in high regard and consider them as safe and inclusive spaces they can turn to for information support. In a world of misinformation, the library's role has grown into helping people feel less exhausted or overwhelmed when it comes to finding quality health information and to empower them to be better information seekers and consumers of information. Libraries can teach their patrons the information literacy skills needed to successfully navigate a complex information landscape, especially when it comes to understanding misinformation spread, particularly on social media. Libraries can promote critical thinking and critical information evaluation skills, such as the ability to detect misinformation, how to verify information, i.e. fact-checking, how to find credible information and share it ethically, and to recognize a vulnerability in themselves to misinformation. This can be done by providing informational websites and programming or workshops around misinformation. By building people's awareness of misinformation and their skills to detect it, libraries can support misinformation resilience in their communities. So how to talk about health misinformation with your community starts by showing respect for users' beliefs engaging in a reference interview, steering the user to research tools and verified resources, and avoiding arguments as to the facts by instead teaching information literacy skills. That will also include how to critically evaluate the accuracy of information and sources found whenever there is an opportunity to do so. So first listen. The best way to change someone's mind about misinformation is to listen to their fears and why they believe what they do. So what to listen for? Any cultural characteristics? individual morals, values, and goals, their in-group norms and behaviors, ask to be shown what they are seeing online, suggest talking to a health professional they trust about the specific concerns. Remember to emphasize, when talking, emphasize the fact that you understand that there are reasons why people find it difficult to trust certain sources of information. Ask questions to understand where they are coming from, whether it is cultural or ideological. Then point to credible sources. Underscore that finding accurate information can be hard, especially during events like the pandemic when the information is constantly changing, which will always happen with a new virus or disease. Stress the need to find credible sources, ones that are not in a position to personally profit or to gain power or influence when seeking information. Utilize the patron's preferred methods of obtaining information and provide resources in that category. Here are some great resources for further reading. Ask them to share online sources they trust to understand where they are getting their information. Discuss how hard it is to get accurate information when the research is continuously being updated, but point to sites that you think do a good job of being transparent. Avoid being judgmental about any of the sources of information they use or making assumptions that they should know where to go for accurate information. And don't publicly shame. Be sensitive to tone. Use non-judgmental language and open-ended questions. Remember, no one likes to appear wrong. A caring tone of voice could help more people. Be gentle in your replies and remember to listen and be emphatic. Avoid publicly embarrassing or sharing any fact checks that make fun of their beliefs. Avoid searching for information only to prove a point or telling them they are wrong. Teaching people how to critically evaluate the accuracy of information and sources can reduce the influence of misinformation and the likelihood that people will share misinformation. There is emerging evidence that it is possible to preemptively debunk or pre-bunk misinformation before false beliefs or ways of thinking have a chance to take hold. People can be inoculated against misinformation. The types of interventions that libraries can use to inoculate people against misinformation techniques can range from consolidating resources on a web page with information addressing common health misinformation myths or FAQs, adding links to expert or credible resources such as the Know the Science page from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health or Medline Plus's page on understanding medical research or its tutorial on evaluating internet health information. The NNLM or the National Network of Libraries of Medicine has a 
tools to evaluate health information page that contains many useful resources on evaluating online health information. Inoculation may be accomplished with library programming that incorporates games that can increase a player's ability to spot misinformation, understand where it comes from, how it is spread, and boost their immunity to false information. Some examples of interactive misinformation inoculation games include Bad News, Cranky Uncle about climate misinformation, Harmony Square about political disinformation and polarization, and those most relevant to public health, Go Viral, Factitious, and the Aforgren Investigation. It is said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Infographics help people to understand complex, complex concepts through the use of visual data, charts, and statistics. There are a ton of infographics available on spotting or detecting misinformation and fake news. You may want to consider adding one to your library's webpage or creating one of your own. In addition to infographics, or instead of, you might want to embed on your library's website short video tutorials on recognizing and combating misinformation. Or again, if the capacity and resources are available, create your own short misinformation videos. So, how trustworthy do US adults, most US adults consider those who certify health science? A New York Times Siena College poll conducted in 2020, revealed that 90% of Democrats trust medical experts, but only 75% of Republicans do. And a majority of Americans, 84% of the U.S. population, say they trust medical scientists, and 77% say the same about the CDC. There are many reliable fact-checking groups, such as the Associated Press, Reuters, USA Today, The Washington Post, Political Fact, and FactCheck.org including ones that focus especially on health information, such as FlatCheck.org's Health Check, Science Up First, iHealth Facts, HealthFeedback.org, and Retaction Watch. These sites attempt to verify scientific or health claims in the media by contacting subject matter experts who provide credible references to recently published credible scientific literature that supports the analysis. So, how do you verify if the sources of health information are credible? <clears throat> the National Academy of Medicine held a forum in 2021 on identifying credible sources of health information and came up with a set of principles for sources providing health information. It should be science-based. Sources should provide information that's consistent with the best scientific evidence available at the time and meet standards for the creation, review, and presentation of scientific content. It should be objective. Sources should take steps to reduce the influence of financial and other forms of conflict of interest or bias that might compromise or be proceed to compromise the quality of the information they provide. It should be transparent and accountable. Sources should disclose the limitations of the information they provide as well as conflicts of interest, content errors, and procedural missteps. At the frontiers of understanding, scientific knowledge changes over time as more evidence becomes available and as existing evidence is analyzed in new ways. To maintain credibility, sources must clearly acknowledge the limitations of the information they share so that consumers can fully, fully reach informed conclusions. They also noted that it is important that, I quote, trusted is not synonymous with credible. Sources considered credible by the author's definition may not be trusted by all individuals and groups while sources that are widely trusted may not be credible. Trust affects the perception of credibility and by extension, the influence of credible sources of health information. The report authors also developed this flowchart for credibility assessment of nonprofit and governmental organizations. Even sources found credible through this flowchart should strive to meet the author's stated credibility principles and attributes as noted in the previous slide. You may already be familiar with the Han code or health on the net icon. The health on the net was born in 1995 during the beginning of the World Wide Web from a collective decision by health specialists. 
The experts who created Han anticipated the need for trustworthy health information online. Han code is the oldest and most used ethical and trustworthy code for medical and health related information available on the internet. The Han code certifies websites according to eight principles. Authority. It provides the qualifications of the authors of the site. Complementarily, the information is to support, not replace consulting with a health care provider. Confidentiality. Respects the privacy of site users. Attribution. Cites the sources and dates of medical information. Justifiability. Justification of the claims in a balanced and objective manner. Transparency. Accessible, easy to use, and provides valid contact details. Financial disclosure. Provides details of site funding. Advertising. Clearly distinguishes advertising from editorial content. For over two decades, the Han Code has been adopted by more than 8,000 websites. With all of that in mind, here are some fact-checking tips when confronted with a health information source. First, be sure to read beyond the headline or what is copy and pasted into a Facebook, Twitter, or blog post. Check the sources. Is a link or citation to any studies mentioned? Or is there only a vague line about science says or studies show? Note the date of the article or social media post to check to see if the information could be out of date. Advance. Advanced tip. Double check the study that's being cited to see if it's been red flagged in retraction off. Check what other trusted sources report. Have the same findings been reported in many credible media source outlets, or are you only seeing what is on social media or just one news site? Do other medical or public health experts provide their opinion and explain what the findings could mean for the real world? Just one study on 10 people does not equal what works for the general population. Advanced tip. Fact check the statements using nonpartisan sites like factcheck.org or healthfeedback.org. Scan for bias and deception in tone, world choice, and imaging. Does the story try to use scientific sounding language to make it seem more legitimate? Tactics like sci science exploitation, when media reporting takes a legitimate area of science and inaccurately simplifies it for the general public, are often used to push questionable prevention strategies and treatment. Does it use biased or loaded or politicized phrases? Do the photos, videos, or charts seem questionable? Advanced tip. Use a reverse image search engine to figure out if it's been altered or taken out of context with tools like Google Reverse Image Search or TinEye. Check the credentials reputation of the researcher. Dig even deeper into the expert being cited. Even if their credentials seem legitimate at first glance, for example, a PhD or MD, you can do a Google search to see what their reputation is among other experts. Has the research been strongly supported or widely debunked? Are they found among keywords like retraction, fabrication, falsified data, scientific misconduct, pseudoscience, or conspiracy theory? A good example of how this may be done is David Gorski's 2001 post, Vaccines and Infant Mortality Rates, a False Relationship Promoted by the Anti-Vaccine Movement in ScienceBasedMedicine.org. I am now going to talk about a couple of credible and evidence-based health information sites. Anyone who has answered health information questions should be familiar with Medline Plus. Medline Plus is produced by the National Library of Medicine. This website is a reliable source of scientifically based, peer-reviewed health information. There's no advertising because it's already paid for by tax dollars. All the information is written by healthcare professionals, MDs, PhDs, RNs, etc and uses a set of strict selection criteria to choose quality resources to include on their health topic pages. Health topics are regularly reviewed and the links are updated daily. Medline Plus uses the American Hospital Formulary Service Consumer Medication Information from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists to provide extensive information on over 1,500 brand name drugs and generic prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and vaccines. The lab test pages includes a list of references that were used to create the content on the page. If you have one place to go for information, this should be it. 
The National Library of Medicine's Daily Med is a searchable database providing the most recent labeling submitted to the Food and Drug Administration by companies and it is, that is currently in use. Daily Med contains labeling for prescription and non-prescription drugs for human and animal use and for additional products such as medical gases, devices, cosmetics, dietary supplements, and medical foods. The Office of Dietary Supplements, part of the National Institutes of Health, its mission is to strengthen knowledge and understanding of dietary supplements by evaluating scientific information, stimulating and supporting research, disseminating research results, and educating the public to foster an enhanced quality of life and health for the U.S. population. Here are a few nonprofit sources of credible health information. KidsHealth.org is part of the Nemours Foundation and was founded in 1995 and is the most viewed site for dependable information on children's health, behavior, and development from before birth through the teen years. It contains doctor-reviewed advice on hundreds of physical, emotional, and behavioral topics from before birth through the teen years. It has separate sections for kids, parents, and teens. The articles and features on kids' health go through a rigorous editorial process that includes review by medical professionals. The articles, animations, and features on the site are created by the clinicians, editors, and designers at the nonprofit Nemers Health Children's Health. Their goal is to make sure that all information is accurate, balanced, current, and family friendly. Doctors and other health experts review all content before it is published on Kids Health. Content is reviewed and updated on a regular basis to keep medical information accurate and relevant. Articles show the most recent review dates and expert reviewer names where appropriate. The Mayo Clinic is technically not for profit. However, it is worth keeping in mind that it is a medical institution that makes money by promoting and billing for its medical services. Aside from that note, all content on mayoclinic.org is original content produced by the Mayo Clinic staff, except for select material that meets strict standards including drug and supplemental databases. Content is updated on both a regularly scheduled basis and whenever necessary to reflect new or revised health policy guidelines, treatment protocols, and critical research findings. They provide transparency into the content creation process by disclosing source materials through direct attribution, documented references or both, dating all original content, and responding swiftly to all reasonable requests for more information about published content. The American Academy of Family Physicians FamilyDoctor.org is the AAFP's consumer website featuring physician-reviewed patient education materials. Content is created by family doctors or professional writers who have experience developing health content for patients and is reviewed by a medical review board of family doctors to ensure the information is medically accurate, complete, and useful, and adheres to evidence-based medicine, AAFP product policies, and clinical practice guidelines. Testing.com is a health information web resource designed to help patients and caregivers understand the many lab tests that are a vital part of medical care. Their goal is to help patients access reliable testing information so they can make informed decisions about their health. Testing.com, formerly Lab Tests Online, was launched in 2001 by the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, a global scientific and medical professional organization dedicated to clinical laboratory science and its application to healthcare. Lab Tests Online was acquired by OneCare Media in 2021 and rebranded as testing.com. So it does include ads for at-home tests. However, testing.com medical does have a medical review board that is made up of experts from the clinical laboratory profession and other health professions. I have thrown a ton of information at you, and to help you, I have created a health misinformation libguide that contains presentation recaps, resources, references, along with information and links to tools like games, videos, and infographics to help you with, help you and your patrons understand, identify, and combat health misinformation. You can find the libguide at hhp at lib.umn.edu backslash health misinformation. Thank you.